Being the last release of the year of Home Assistant, let's reflect on what the amazing team has achieved. This was marked as the year of the voice, and I think they've really delivered on this. You can type commands to Home Assistant, you can talk to it really easily with the press of a button on your phone or on your web browser. Turn on steady light. Turn on switch. And also it can talk back to you as well. And this is all done locally without the need for the cloud. A couple of months ago, the first increment of the wait word functionality was introduced, meaning you can talk to Home Assistant without pressing any buttons at all, just like the big boys of Google and Amazon can do. Now, in the first year, I was never going to expect it to compete with these, but they've laid down really good foundations. And if you look at ChatGPT, that really leads the way, to be honest. And if you look at Google and Amazon, they're quite disappointing in comparison. And I suspect they'll force you to buy new hardware to take advantage of the AI enhancements and throw away your old devices. So I'm going to wait and stick around for Home Assistant to catch up, which I'm sure they will. Anyway, now let's take a look through the new features for the final release of the year. First up is a nice little user experience feature when you log in. So it will show you nice little bubbles of users rather than have to type a username. For security reasons, this is only when you're on your local network and it will look like this instead when you're doing it externally. Next up is a feature that's a very similar trend to other releases this year, and this time it's an enhancement to the thermostat card. So you can now add HVAC modes and climate presets to the thermostat card. You need to select the features when you're adding the card to the dashboard. You can also select between a drop down and icons, just like you can with the tile card. In my example, I've only got heating shown on the tile card, but if your heating system supports cooling as well, then it can actually show both on the same card and it looks really neat. And of course, it wouldn't be a home system release anymore if there weren't updates to the tile card. So this month, we've got updates to allow input numbers to be added to a tile card. Previously, you could get a slider on the UI by using the Entities card and setting the display mode to slider, but it's nowhere near as pretty, and I found it quite difficult to get the setting in the right place on the slider bar. This one is much easier. The next one is changes to history graphs. This is really useful for some sensor types to see history of changes over time. And for this reason, earlier this year, they added something called long-term statistics, which saves some averages of data for longer than what you get Home Assistant to store the data for normally. The history graphs have been changed so that they use this long-term statistics data in combination with the normal history information so that you can see stats for a longer period of time. I can see this being really useful for entities such as temperature sensors. The next one is just a little dashboard tweak when you're creating a new dashboard. Previously, it would add all of the entities for you automatically, and then when you edited the dashboard, it would ask you if you wanted a blank dashboard or if you wanted to start off with the one that it had recommended. Now it gives you the option up front, so when you're creating a dashboard, you can either select a blank one or get it to create one for you using the areas. When editing the dashboard, you can also select whether you want it to show entities that have no area defined, or also you can hide the energy dashboard. The next one is updates to blueprints. This is great for users of blueprints and also developers as well. So updates to blueprints that are done by developers can now be accepted by users rather than having to do it manually. I know that Smart Home Junkie in particular will be pleased with this update because he's always doing changes to his Ulanzi blueprints. Have a read through the release notes for more details on updating blueprints correctly. Next up is to-do lists. In the last release, they added this functionality, but it clearly had some gaps. And in this release, they've addressed some of those gaps and added some functionality. There is now a service to remove completed items from your to-do list. A few releases ago, they added the very powerful functionality whereby you could receive data back from making service calls. And in this release, they've taken advantage of that by being able to make a service call to to-do lists to retrieve all the items on a to-do list. You can also now add due dates to to-do list items as well, but this is only from service calls at the moment. So watch out for this in the next release or two where they'll probably add it to the UI. They've also added the to-do list name to the URL which I think is really handy because it means you can reference the to-do list directly. So you could use this for things like dashboards in the kitchen to display your shopping list or perhaps for sending the list to a family member. And we're not done with to-do list changes yet either. There's a new integration for Our Groceries, which is an app for Android and iOS, where you can create shopping lists or recipes. There's also an integration with Picnic, which I believe is a Dutch online grocery store. And finally, the WebDAV integration can now track the number of active to-do list items. I know for me, this number will stay quite large all of the time. 
A few of the changes to mention is that there's a new trigger selector for blueprints, there's more ESP home performance improvements, which are always welcome, and also the ability to show maps for your RoboRock vacuums, which I'm looking forward to in particular. I currently use a custom integration for this, but it doesn't always work. There are quite a few new integrations this month, and the first one is the Linear Garage Door integration. This one's an interesting one because there was recently controversy around an integration called MyQ, whereby the vendor has removed the ability to integrate with it. So that's been removed in this release. Check out this video by Everything Smart Home for more context. A wheelchair integration has been added in this release, and that's really nice to see. And there's quite a lot of sensors available for it, so you can look at things like battery charge and distance travelled. There's now also a new integration for a very premium speaker brand, Duvalet. I'm surprised that there are any integrations left that aren't via the UI, but apparently there are. So this month we've got CalDAV, which now can be done via the UI, Fast.com, which is a speed test tool, and also Ping. Braking changes have now been renamed to backward incompatible changes this month, which certainly doesn't roll off the tongue, but a lot of the changes aren't necessarily as major as the word braking suggested. So I think the change of wording makes sense. As always, have a look through yourself to see if there's any changes that impact you. I'll leave a link in the description to the beta release note documentation. Well, that's it for today, so please consider subscribing if you haven't already, and liking the video if you enjoyed it. Also, comment down below with your favourite new features. So thanks, until next time.